Good evening, everyone. Welcome, and thank you for uh, spending some time with us. I'm Simeon Bankoff, Executive Director of the Historic Districts Council. HGC is the citywide advocate for New York's historic neighborhoods. We're a 50-year-old organization uh, who helps neighborhood groups and volunteer organizations and citizen activists to preserve, enhance, and protect the physical character of our historic city. As people may be aware, um, this is a very busy summer with regards to preservation issues. After the long um, sort of slumber that has been imposed on us by COVID and the pandemic, and then of course the heat, we've woken up to notice a series of um, events and plans that have been percolating away while all of us have been staying at home and socially distanced. We thought that it would actually be uh, a useful thing, particularly as many of these particular issues affect vast swaths of our city and are on specific timelines to uh, take a moment and try to bring everybody up to date on some of the most pressing uh, preservation issues in New York. If your issue that you're familiar with has not is not mentioned, that's because there's so much, very much going on. We do very much welcome people participating through the chat. We will be answering questions as live as possible. Um, the, uh, the, what, how we will be doing this is each of our presenters will be speaking, uh, doing a presentation for about 10 minutes. Then we're gonna do a five minute kind of lightning round um, where I will be asking them questions given to us uh, through, through, your question, uh, through the questions uh, function on the bottom and then moving on so that we can have a informative and extraordinarily, uh, but informative while uh, brisk uh, program. Uh, we will also be circulating and following up with regards uh, to all the attendees on calls to action, uh, calls to action, email links, and things that you can do and get involved with and learn more about. So. Uh, without any further ado, it is my pleasure to introduce Andrew Berman. Andrew is the Executive Director of Village Preservation and um, who is one of uh, New York City's strongest preservation organizations and the largest community organization in Greenwich Village. So Andrew. Uh, thanks so much, Simeon. Uh, it's not currently letting me share screen. Whoops, let, that's because we swapped out for you. So let me make you a co-host yet again. Here we go. Great. All right. Thank you so much. Thank so uh, first of all, I'm going to just drop into the chat um, a couple of quick links uh, so that folks have them to follow up um, regarding the Soho NoHo rezoning, which is what I'm here to talk about today. This is a ULERP action, which is uh, in process, 56 blocks um, of the Soho and NoHo neighborhoods, as well as a slice of Chinatown. It is set to be voted on in its entirety uh, before the end of the year. And actually, I'm going to have to cut out of this event a little bit early because I have to run to the community board um, vote on this issue tonight. So that gives you a sense of exactly how um, in process it is. So I'm going to share my screen. Uh, let me know, are you seeing that? Seeing it. Very good. All right, great. So what you're seeing right now is a map of the proposed rezoning area. And very quickly, the sort of violet colored stuff is the area where the city wants to up zone by 20%. The blue stuff is where the city wants to up zone to just shy of double the currently allowable size of development. And the orange slash golden stuff up here in the corners is where they want to allow development at about two and a half times the size of what the current rules for these neighborhoods allow. And the, the development that they currently allow is not exactly small, demure, tiny. So we're talking about an increase of up to two and a half times the size of what's currently allowed. This is unprecedented to do this kind of upzoning in, uh, in any kind of uh, historic district or landmark area, or I think even in any residential area. But while it's without precedent, it's clearly meant to set a precedent. The mayor and the other supporters of this plan have made clear that they see this as the first in what they hope will be many 
up zonings of historic neighborhoods throughout the city, which they've specifically targeted saying they're not pulling their weight, they're not doing their job, they're not providing housing production, they're not providing enough development. So uh, this is not just about Soho and NoHo, but about historic neighborhoods citywide. Um, at the, uh, in this golden area, they wanna upzone the allowable FAR to 12. That happens to be the maximum legally allowable FAR in the state of New York for residential development. So this is as dense of, of zoning as is legally permissible in New York State on Billionaire's Row in Midtown, the allowable FAR is 10. So this would be 20% higher to give you a sense of how great the density is that they're proposing for this area. Um, it would incentivize the demolition of historic buildings, both ones that are located in New York City historic districts, but also a lot of historic buildings that aren't. About 80% of the rezoning area is landmarked, but much of the rest of it, uh, landmarked in historic districts, much of the rest of it is located in state and national register districts, uh, some of which are not landmarked, so they have no protections whatsoever. And even within the landmark districts with that incredibly high uh, FAR, much, much higher than the existing built form, which averages at somewhere between 4.5 FAR and 5 FAR, there's gonna be tremendous incentive for demolition. There's also gonna be tremendous incentive for oversized vertical enlargements, rooftop additions, et cetera. Um, and it's basically going to guarantee that uh, new construction in this area will be grossly out of scale. There's been a lot of new construction in Soho and NoHo uh, in recent years. Most of it, whether you like the design or hate the design or feel somewhere in between, has been largely in scale for the neighborhood. Uh, not shrinking violets, but in scale. Uh, imagine that at two, two and a half times the size of what you've seen going up in the neighborhood in, in recent years. Um, it will also incentivize the demolition of a good deal of rent regulated affordable housing in the neighborhood that currently houses hundreds of low to moderate income residents, usually ones who've been here for decades, who helped build this neighborhood. And especially in the Chinatown section of the neighborhood, they're, they're disproportionately Asian American. They're also disproportionately seniors and artists who are able to hold on in this neighborhood because of the rent regulated housing. The, uh, the reason why this is particularly relevant is because the entire um, premise of this rezoning is that it's necessary to make these neighborhoods more equitable and more affordable. Um, analysis that we've done, and I will show you what some of that analysis is, uh, shows exactly the opposite. Um, that in fact, what the rezoning would do um, would decrease socioeconomic diversity in the neighborhood because among other things, what it, it would result in the demolition of a great deal of this rent regulated affordable housing um, because by increasing the allowable FAR so greatly, you're basically putting a, a, a target on these buildings, which are largely four, six, five, seven story buildings, walk up buildings that have rent regulated units, loft law, um, et cetera, they are gonna be destroyed. And by contrast, we also see that um, the, uh, uh, the city's proposal, while it claims that it's all about affordable housing and in theory re would require affordable housing in certain kinds of development has, is full of loopholes full of uh, types of development that have no affordable housing requirements attached to them whatsoever. This includes any kind of commercial development, any kind of retail development, any kind of hotel office space, um, NYU and other university development, which the rezoning would allow in this area, which is currently restricted, any other kind of for-profit community facility development, and even luxury market rate residential development, condos and rentals would be exempted from the affordable housing requirements as long as they are no more than 25,000 square feet, which is a pretty generous allowance. And to add insult to injury, that's 25,000 square feet per zoning lot. So if a developer owns multiple zoning lots, they can split it over the multiple zoning lots and still get, and get the even larger uh, exemption. Um, and I should also mention that they're rezoning in addition to allowing 
NYU and other universities to move into the neighborhood, which they've been salivating over the prospect, but haven't been able to. It would also allow big box chain stores of unlimited size, uh, which would push out all of the remaining small businesses in the neighborhood, push out all of the remaining art galleries and arts related uh, uses, unless they happen to be lucky enough to own their own building, which most do not. Um, and it would uh, utterly change the landscape uh, of the neighborhood. Um, our analysis has also shown, by the way, that even if the city's projections, and I think we all know from experience that the city's projections about what their rezonings will result in are notoriously off base. Um, in East Midtown, practically all of the new developments out of the gate have been ones that the city projected were sites where no development could take place. But even if the city's uh, projections are accurate, we did an analysis and it showed that new developments that are 75% market rate, 25% affordable as the city would require, would still skew the neighborhood richer and more expensive and probably less racially diverse than it is now. And that's because new market rate housing in Soho and NoHo is so expensive, it will undoubtedly be occupied by people in the top five to at most 10% of the income levels of the neighborhood with prices that match. And the 25% affordable, quote unquote, would actually, even for a neighborhood like Soho, no, neighborhoods like Soho and Noho and Chinatown, which certainly do have a lot of wealthy people, though that 25% affordable housing would be too expensive for the poorest people who currently live in the neighborhood. Um, so the affordable housing would be more unaffordable and wealthier than the lower income people in the neighborhood. And the new housing would be basically more of the top five or 10% uh, in the neighborhood. And that's why we've gotten um, support from affordable housing and tenants groups, in addition to um, historic preservation groups across the city, state and country uh, that have come out against this. Um, and we've also uh, proposed, along with about 14 other um, uh, local neighborhood groups, an alternative rezoning plan for uh, the neighborhood, um, because we do believe that there are some aspects of the existing zoning that could be updated that uh, when they were created uh, uh, 50 years ago reflected different circumstances than we have today. We also do believe that these neighborhoods and all historic districts should contribute to making the city more equitable and more affordable. So our community alternative plan that about 14 local groups uh, have endorsed calls for deeper uh, and more broadly affordable new housing, but without the massive upzonings that would encourage the demolition of either historic buildings or buildings that have rent regulated uh, affordable units currently in them. None of the big box chain stores None of the NYU giveaways and the other giveaways to developers, um, but would encourage the construction of affordable housing on lots that are currently parking lots, one, two, and three story, not historically significant uh, commercial buildings with no uh, residents in them. Um, and uh, you know, the, the city of course is not interested in that. What they're really interested in is the uh, giveaway to developers um, and they've, uh, denied the uh, analysis that we've shown that the many loopholes in the plan means that it will result in little, if any, affordable housing. It makes it much more enticing for developers to build uh, without affordable housing than it is to build with it. Um, and what this will result in is the uh, irreversible destruction of these uh, iconic historic neighborhoods in the name of something that will not be achieved. Um, and that is basically a entirely false premise uh, of the proposal. Um, and buttressed by the fact that we've offered a different version that doesn't have the developer giveaways, doesn't have the dangerous and detrimental impacts. And of course the city is completely resistant. So I believe that's about my 10 minutes. So I'm happy to turn it over to Q&A. Great, um, Andrew, the, the, we have a question which is, how can we stop this? What city agency or what is, is there a strategy for trying to stop this in its tracks? Sure. 
So it's going through the Euler process. It's already, uh, the horse is already out of that barn. Um, but that means it still has to go through that public review and approval process. It's going to be voted on a community board two tonight. We're confident that they're going to resoundingly reject it. From there, it goes to the borough president, then the city planning commission, which of course is controlled by the mayor, and then the city council. So the link that I uh, dropped into the chat includes a uh, form letter that you can send to every member of the city council, the city planning commission, the borough president, the mayor, et cetera, telling them that you unequivocally oppose it. Um, and if you also go to our website and we included a link to our upzoning Soho and NoHo page, and if you get on our email list, we'll notify you when the upcoming hearings are happening. So in addition to sending these letters, you can come to these hearings um, and you can help us to, uh, to urge these bodies to vote them down. Um, terrific. Now, uh, is there, uh, can you sort of explain how this is gonna put pressure onto the landmark properties? Sure. Well, um, and by the way, this is our version of the community alternative plan in Mandarin. One of the many shameful things about the city's effort is they've hidden the fact that it includes Chinatown and have done no outreach to the uh, Chinese community. So look, uh, the city will say, well, at the end of the day, at least for the landmark parts, it's up to the discretion of the LPC. And it will still statutorily remain up to the discretion of the LPC. But when you have the... Um, uh, zoning increase to twice or more what's currently allowable, that's going to create incredible incentives for developers to seek to have their buildings approved for demolition, approved for radical alterations, approved for huge additions placed on top. And as we all know, the uh, LPC does not always make the right decision. Uh, they are certainly vulnerable to this sort of, uh, of pressure. Uh, uh, and this sort of pressure campaign. Um, so we certainly believe that it will, um, it, it will have that impact. And it will also mean that even in cases where, you know, there's not a historic building um, and new development is appropriate, that the type of new development that they'll be seeking approval for will be way, way, way out of scale uh, for the district and, and for the, the neighborhood. Thank you. Um, anything else you want to add? Because I know you've got to skedaddle over to community board too. Uh, you know, no, I would, the last thing I will just say is, you know, we ask other neighborhoods and other local community groups very, very sparingly to get involved in issues in our neighborhood because we know everybody has so much on their plates. Um, but this is one that clearly is of citywide uh, uh, importance in terms of it being the first in what is expected to be many of these. If they succeed here, they are absolutely, they have said this, this isn't our reading of the tea leaves. They have said, we're gonna try to do the exact same thing to other historic neighborhoods throughout New York City. So for that reason, even if you don't care that much about Soho and NoHo, I would urge you to join in the opposition to this and make sure that this does not happen. Thank you. Very well said, and I and I can't reinforce that more. This is affecting all of us. Thanks so much. All right. Good luck. Thank you. All right. Now I'd like to turn this over to Dr. Keith Taylor. Uh, Keith is a community board member of Community Board Ten, and also the president of the Dorrance Brook Square Property and Residence Association. Um, Keith, you've got to unmute yourself. Thank you, Simeon, and uh, hello to everyone who's watching to, to this evening. Uh, I'll give a, a bit of a background uh, about this effort to uh, preserve this area in central Harlem. Uh, back in 2008, the 125th Street rezoning uh, made the local community board, Community Board 10, realize that um, this upper Manhattan in general was, was underserved regarding historic preservation efforts. And uh, so they, they worked on a historic preservation plan and they identified approximately nine different areas in central Harlem where uh, they identified them as historic study areas. Uh, and Landmarks Preservation Commission has been working with uh, the community board to go through each of these proposed historic districts. This, this 
I was actually trying to put on the chat, I will do so after I speak uh, the um, historic, oh, well, Simon, you might be able to do it. If you Google CB10 historic preservation plan, it'll pop right up. Um, but but I uh, what Simeon just uh, put in the chat was the website for the Dorrance Brooks Property Owners and Residents Association, where uh, from the beginning of these efforts, we realized it was important to document what was what we were doing so that we might help others who are trying to do the same thing. So. On our webpage, there's a lot of uh, you know everything from our applications to to uh, the National Park Service to the state um, uh, to get historic uh, preservation designation and our uh, application to to Landmarks Preservation Commission. So we we in 2017 there was a, a church that was sold. Uh, on 140th and Edgecombe, Mount Calvary, United Methodist Church. A, uh, and, and the developer um, indicated that it was going to be torn down. And it is no secret that churches have been uh, particularly vulnerable to being torn down because of their size and, and, and the value of, of being able to build uh to a much larger scale uh so what we did as a block association because i come to you as a block association president we invited uh some stakeholders simeon was one of them, uh, representing historic uh, districts council yuan chen was another person uh who was very instrumental she uh represented west harlem uh community preservation organization and talk to them about this frustration we had, even with this historic preservation plan to actually uh, be able to stop this church from being torn down. Out of that frustration, we uh, were put in contact with the, uh, uh, Mar Marissa Marvelli, who did a wonderful job of helping us with our application to the state uh, to get uh, designated at the state level as a historic district, including this church, and also to be recognized uh, at the federal level. So we had both the federal and state recognition that this church was worthy of designation and uh, the full demo permits were issued by the buildings department. So all of that effort meant nothing. Our last uh, our last attempt to save the church was the city landmark preservation designation. And so in 2019, we got both of those, uh, the state and the federal designation. And in uh, June of this last month, the uh, Landmarks Preservation Commission unanimously voted to make this Central Harlem uh, proposed uh, landmark district they unanimously voted to approve it and they also included a uh an area that is next to adjacent to this uh to this to the original application they included that to pretty much double the size of the original um uh application the geographic area they included the church despite the developed the owners uh uh protests against that and putting in motion this, uh, this quandary where even though the church is now part of a city landmark district, because of the pre-existing demolition permits, it can be torn down, which would, we could conceivably end up with a empty lot in a, in a historic preservation district. So, uh, we left this in June with the Landmarks Preservation Commission uh, in contact with uh, the uh, owner, with the developer, to see if there was a way for this uh, demolition to not take place. I, I can say that 
you know, I, I have not since last month, I don't know if there have been any um, encouraging developments with that effort, but I do know that a few days ago, the buildings department issued a full stop work order on one of the two, uh, actually on both of the two adjoining brownstones, which are part of this whole development effort next to the church, full stop work orders, because the parapet, parapet wall in the rears, they've partially collapsed and they're, and they're in danger of, of further collapse into the rear yard. This to me sort of speaks of this idea of a benign neglect of allowing a, uh, a structure such as a church to sufficiently um, uh, deteriorate to the point where now uh, it cannot be uh, preserved because it's presumably a public safety hazard. And so um, that is where we are in this effort uh, to, to um, preserve this, 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 this church, which has a lot of historical uh, significance to this neighborhood. Um, the, the neighborhood was built between 1886 and 1904. This particular church is a Gothic revival style church. It was built in 1897, 1898 for a German Lutheran congregation. And later that became the Mount Calvary United Methodist Church. The first African-American Congresswoman, Shirley Chisholm taught there for seven years. And at one point the church boasted one of the largest Methodist congregations in Harlem. So the community knows full well the value of this church. It's fought hard to preserve it. Um, the developer, on the other hand, is fighting hard to demolish it. And so we are, you know, working hard to try and, 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 and make our case that it does deserve to be incorporated in whatever the developer is trying to do. So that is where we are. Thanks so very much, Keith. Um, the next steps, as I understand it, is they this will be going uh, to the City Planning Commission. I don't believe it has stopped there yet, uh, although I will admit that I've lost track of the City Planning schedule because it's gotten a little jumbled with, um, with everything going on. And then it's on to the City Council. Um, is there a way for people to get involved so that they can show up and speak to the city council. I did post in the chat a, a letter to uh, you know, the mayor the, and the city council leaders. Um, and we will, as, as things get closer, we'll, we'll try to be more um, active about that and be more specific. But I mean, is there anything that we can do to help the association on this? Uh, certainly, uh, I, I think uh, if, if there are any individuals that may be able to help us uh, with this effort, I, I, you can contact me through the website, the Dorrance Brooks uh, Properties and Residence Association website. Um, we, as an organization, we are open to any effort to help us uh, preserve this, this church. It was the impetus for the whole effort to, to uh, save the neighborhood. Um, and, and so, you know, it would truly be a bittersweet victory for this to be approved by city council, for the, the church to be a, um, you know, designated city landmark just to, you know, be torn down. Um, so, uh, you know, any, any and, and all efforts or ideas that individuals have, please contact us, contact me directly. All right. Well, thanks so very much. I know you also have to go run off to a meeting as well. Is there a community board yes. tonight as well? Uh, it's, it's not a community board me. I'm a part of a school board in the Bronx, and then I've got to, uh, we've got to take care of some business there. So we're actually going to meet in person. So I've got to run, run there and, uh, and, and, uh, and uh, work on that effort to provide uh, positive uh, educational uh, efforts for, for young people that live in the Bronx. That's terrific. Well, thanks so very much. Thank uh, you. And everyone should check out their website and get in touch with Keith uh, and keep your eyes peeled as this comes, as this wins its way through the public process. Uh, next, it is my pleasure to introduce 
Brad Vogel, uh, a man of many hats, though he's not wearing one at the moment. Uh, Brad is, a, by profession, uh, by training a lawyer, by profession, the executive director of the uh, New York Preservation Archive Project, and by temperament, an inveterate preservationist who is involved in several, several uh, issues, uh, including the Gowanus, which he will now be speaking for. I, I didn't want to give you an, an affiliation with one of the groups in Gowanus, Brad, because I'm not sure which one you're going to be speaking for, from. Well, thank you so much, Simeon, and thank you to HDC. It's so great to be on tonight, especially to see so many people on the participant list for this event who have helped out on the side or in the main with the effort in Gowanus to oppose the very misguided Gowanus rezoning that is unfortunately, you know, Andrew said earlier that the Soho Noho rezoning, the horse had left the barn. We, we like to think in Gowanus that the armored train has already proceeded down the track of Euler in Gowanus. It's very hard to stop um, this misguided proposal. But I am speaking tonight, I should make very clear, only as an individual resident of Gowanus, a neighborhood in Brooklyn, and also as a member of Voice of Gowanus. Now, this is a community, grassroots community coalition that has emerged basically during the pandemic. It had had a few things before, but it really coalesced and came together during the pandemic, despite the many problems, um, and is looking to stop this rezoning. Now, I am going to share screen and get into this. I have a good number of slides, but we'll whip through them quickly and go from there. And Simeon, are you able to see that? Great, thank you so much. Why the Gowanus rezoning must be opposed. Now, some of you know that we actually fired off a lawsuit um, against city planning regarding some procedural issues with this, um, trying to hold a Euler hearing in a different manner than usual during the pandemic. But tonight I'm going to try to tell you a little bit more about the substance of this rezoning and why we are so concerned. So Voice of Gowanus, as I mentioned, is a grassroots community coalition. These are people who have been involved in trying to get the Gowanus Canal, the very the notoriously polluted waterway in, in Gowanus. There were people involved in the effort to get that designated a Superfund site back in 2010. There were people who had never been involved in a community effort on anything before who came out of the woodwork. So it's a very interesting uh, group with lots of different people coming from a lot of different places. But we did our best during the pandemic to get out and show opposition and raise concerns about this proposal. Now this, just to give you a sense, is one of the arms of the Gowanus Canal. And so right now there is actually dredging underway to remove what's called black mayonnaise, which is this 10 to 12 foot layer thick of horribly polluted toxic material at the bottom. And a lot of the land in Gowanus is also quite polluted. Now, this is a map of the proposed rezoning. Now, as you can see, Gowanus is at sort of the core of this area, but there's also this very long red line on the other side. And, and basically the point I want to make with this is, this is an incredibly, incredibly arrogant, hubristic and ambitious, overly ambitious rezoning that attempts to bite off more than it, it should. Uh, it is impacting multiple neighborhoods, um, even though it's called the Gowanus rezoning, it's going to have all sorts of impacts if, if passed on surrounding neighborhoods like Park Slope, Forum Hill, Cobble, uh, Cobble Hill, Carroll Gardens, and Red Hook, Sunset Park, Greenwood Heights. It's, it's going to have impacts flowing out based on the densities that are envisioned here. Uh, we are talking in the light sort of cyan blue, we're talking 22 plus to 30 plus story buildings um, in the floodplain along the canal that is still not fully cleaned up, uh, in many cases on polluted land. Um, and, you know, this, this neighborhood right now has buildings, there's, there's sort of two buildings that are about 12 stories high. Otherwise, everything else is sort of six feet and lower, uh, with the exception of this long strip of Fourth Avenue in red. So drastic change and also a major change in moving away from manufacturing zoning to residential. Now, of course, as with so many of these rezonings, the thing that is trumpeted is affordable housing, affordable housing, affordable housing until people are blue in the face. But what is the majority of the housing type or the units that will be created? 
not affordable, but market rate. And if the images presented by some of the developers are to believe luxury market rate units will dominate the units created here. And we are talking to the tune of 20,000 new residents imposed on this very ecologically sensitive and already harmed neighborhood. This is just a sense for you of the build out that we're talking. You'll look over at the far left here in the yellow blocks. That is an area called public place. Now I'll say more about that soon, but that's where some of the largest buildings are envisioned. Public place is also one of the most polluted sites in the state of New York. Um, it was a former manufactured gas plant. So there are basically almost aquifers of coal tar, a carcinogenic substance, it's a byproduct of the manufactured gas process down below. That has the ability to migrate and move. Um, so this is, this is about preservation and I will get to that, but there are so many other issues and I wanted to make sure you knew about them because they are real problems when it comes to preserving community um, and livability in this neighborhood. Now, HDC was crucial in helping in Gowanus get a number of buildings landmarked. Uh, we have things here that some of you may be familiar with, like the uh, Ameri what's it called the American Can Factory or known as the Summers Tinware, Flushing Tunnel. There's a sort of industrial red brick turn of the sort of 1800s to 1900s, turn of that century marker um, buildings from that era. But the list that we asked for was definitely more than 25 buildings, several small historic districts. Um, in 2014, there was an effort that was not successful, alas, to get the whole Gowanus area designated a state and national register district, also HDC involvement there. That did, however, result in eligibility, a determination of eligibility for that district, which was a win because there's at least some de minimis um, indication there that we have historic resources and value. I will tell you a little bit more about this, but uh, that bare baseline itself is actually in jeopardy if this rezoning passes. And I have to stop and mention for a, a moment here, Linda Mariano, who passed away several months ago during the pandemic. Linda was a true blue diehard Gowanus resident, an advocate for and real cherisher, I guess, to, to put a word up a cherisher of historic buildings and of the neighborhood's unique idiosyncratic character. And she will be dearly missed, but she certainly inspires the work of Voice of Gowanus. This is flooding in Gowanus, Hurricane Sandy, 2012. The neighborhood is mostly manufacturing down in the core of it with sort of branches of, of residential coming down into it cheek by jowl. The reason that it was mostly manufacturing at the core of it was because back in the day, it wasn't so hard for people to understand you don't build residential in low lying areas subject to repeat flooding. This is FEMA flood zone A all the way. <laughs> so lots of flooding, this is an overlay. The red here is the zoning, proposed rezoning and the blue and yellow are the flooding. That's a lot of flooding right on top of some of the core residential areas proposed. And even if you, if you elevate the land along some of these areas for giant residential buildings, you also have unintended consequences like up here at the top. And let me just pull up my little pen here with some green ink and go right up here at the top of the Gowanus Canal near the head. There's a low-lying area that is the location of the Gowanus houses, public housing. Now, if you elevate all of the land down here for mega projects for high rise market rate luxury buildings, where does the water go when the storm surge comes? It goes into the bowl at the end of this area. So when you have something this big, it comes with a boatload of unintended consequences. And that's one of the major problems we have. Uh, we have put on all kinds of events to try to educate the public with experts. We have worked with our groups. We have put forward baselines for just and sustainable development to try to highlight what we're talking about here. And here, just a sense of what's at stake. People in a floodplain exacerbating combined sewer overflow. I won't even get into that, but it is not good, suffice it to say. And this rezoning has the potential to make it much, much worse. Placing thousands of people on that public place site on 
on basically coal tar plumes that will not be remediated. And it's about luxury market rate buildings, not affordable. Um, and the rule of law, the environmental impact statement needs to be redone. It must have FEMA and EPA involvement in the preparation, not just commenting on it. Um, but thus far, we have not gotten traction, but that's one of the places where you can help. So let's keep moving along here. Historic resources. There are many of them in Gowanus, but they are at risk if this rezoning passes. Um, it has the potential to eliminate the eligibility for state and national register district status, uh, the loss of specific buildings that HDC and others in the neighborhood have sought to landmark, um, and that in Gowanus was a six to celebrate neighborhood back in 2011, and the general loss of the historic sense of place because this rezoning is happening alongside the Superfund cleanup, which is also impacting and removing any sense of historic place uh, right along the canal. So all that to say, Brooklyn Community Board 2 voted against this rezoning rather handily and thanks to uh, Doreen Gallo and some others uh, who may be on this Zoom. Community Board 6 voted in favor, but with conditions. Uh, borough President uh, held a hearing and it, to my knowledge has not yet actually weighed in, but my guess is he will probably say yay. Uh, that takes us to, you know, it's hard not to feel a little bit of cynicism <laughs> when you encounter this many public officials uh, who are not seeing what's at stake here. But ultimately, what can you do to help? So this is going through ULERP, as I mentioned. City planning is the next stop for that armored train, but that doesn't mean there's no hope. And we hope you will join us. That's at 10 a.m. this Wednesday. Please testify. Uh, we are happy to provide you with testimony if you need it. Uh, if it's not in the chat, it's www.voiceofgowanus.org. Uh, write to federal officials. We need your help in convincing federal officials to force federal agencies to insist that this EIS be redone. And this also has implications for other environmental impact statements and rezonings citywide in low-lying areas, areas where there are federal agency expertise concerns that need to be in play. And finally, sign up for our updates. We send out blasts to get you involved. So if you want to protest, we have, I think Martin BC is on the program this evening. Martin led a punk rock protest at several of the last public hearings. <laughs> uh, we, we throw everything we can at, at these, uh, these opportunities for public input, but we hope you will join us. Gowanus is worth it. Even though it is a civic hot mess out there, we hope you will engage with us and help defeat this rezoning. Thank you. Thank you, Brad. Uh, a couple of questions have, have arisen. Um, has anyone talked about uh, the Newtown Creek disaster of 1978, which uh, was the largest oil spill in American history and is still being mitigated? We are certainly aware of that in Gowanus. Um, and we really don't want to have another incident like that where thousands of people in housing are placed directly on top of plumes of coal tar that go over 150 feet below the surface. We do not want to have, have to have Aaron Brockovich come in at some later date in Gowanus. Yeah, no, and an ounce of prevention is uh, worth a, a pound of prescription. Um, the, uh, also the other question is, uh, Judy Stanton asked, um, has a uh, Congresswoman uh, Nidia Velasquez has been involved or helped in any way? And good old Dan Wiley, um, who shows up at every meeting. Yes, no, here's where things stand with the Congresswoman. Uh, Dan Wiley came and spoke at the CB6, CB2 public hearing. Um, and very, I was, I was heartened to hear this, said on behalf of the Congresswoman that really the EIS did need to be redone. The federal agencies needed to be part of actually doing the analysis, not just commenting on it later as required by law, but, as you know, we really need to get grassroots numbers telling the Congresswoman that this is crucial and giving her the backup she needs to, in, to insist on that with the federal agencies. That is where we're at. So to the extent that you do have a relationship with Nydia, uh, with the Congresswoman, please do reach out to her and insist that the Gowanus EIS be redone with federal involvement. That is the message. 
and feel free to reach out to me if you do want any further clarification on that. Fantastic. Uh, anything else you want to add? Uh, that is it. Thank you very much again for the opportunity, Simeon. Well, thank you, Brad, and thank you for all your really great work. Um, next up, I'd like to introduce George Calderero. Uh, George is a, a longtime advisor of HTC, a, uh, a member of the board of directors of the 29th Street uh, Neighborhood Association, uh, a, a, a member of advisors and board members of several preservation organizations, and a member in good standing of the Empire Station Coalition. And he has with us also, he invited along uh, State Senator Brad Hoyleman, who's somewhere around here. Unfortunately, <laughs> Brad had to jump, but I am here on his behalf. Sorry okay. for my, my audio issues. <laughs> Great, Maya. Thank you, George. Okay. Okay, great. Thanks, Simeon. Thanks, uh, HDC. As uh, Simeon notes, um, I'm an advisor to uh, HDC and a representative of the 29th Street Association, Neighborhood Association and the Victorian Society on the Empire Station Coalition, which is a broad based collection of community groups, including HDC, which coalesced earlier this year in response and opposition to Governor Cuomo's proposed Empire, the underknown, I believe, Empire Station District Complex, which essentially will bulldoze the neighborhood surrounding Penn Station. Um, I invited uh, Senator uh, Brad Hoyleman and his office uh, here because he repre represents the area and has been supportive of the coalition and actions. And, uh, and I hope that Maya can give us an update on where we are and where we're going to be in Albany because this is a state issue. This is an Andrew Cuomo uh, MTA issue. I'll briefly outline the issue at hand um, and then um, uh, and actions that we uh, can take um, to prevent what even Mayor de Blasio, who's no friend of preservation, calls a land grab. Our coalition, along with other groups, including community boards four and five, are opposed to Cuomo and his Empire State Development Corporation scheme to level the blocks around Penn Station containing hundreds of businesses with 9,000 jobs, at least 200 residents, and up to 50 historic viable buildings, including the Hotel Pennsylvania by McKim, Mead and White, which we all know designed the original Penn Station. It should be noted that Vornado Realty, the proposed developer, uh, developer of record for the city, as far as I can tell, uh, has given at least $400,000 to Cuomo in his signature pet project, Moynihan Station. It's time to learn from our mistakes and Cuomo's and end Cuomo's Moses era tactics of declaring a functioning community blighted and using eminent domain to bypass the public process, which is exactly what, what, what is happening and what, what uh, Moses did, as you all know. Uh, these are the blocks around uh, Penn Station that are, are proposed to be uh, demolished. This is a, a detail with calling out historic buildings uh, in the area, many of which are um, uh, National Register or National Register eligible. And we're not saying that these buildings are all proposed to be demolished, but they will be threatened and overshadowed by uh, the proposed um, uh, city. Um, as Senator Kruger, Liz Kruger reasonably asked, when did Andrew Cuomo become Robert Moses? And for what? The so-called Empire Station District promises 20 million square feet of empty office space in 10 super tall buildings uh, when we have millions of square feet of unoccupied commercial space. Additionally, the proposal will only make incremental improvements to Penn Station, but leave it in the basement of Madison Square Garden and will continue train operation in an inefficient dated model instead of unifying the region's commuter rail, which is, is possible. The proposal also calls for two new hotels, but does not consider the relatively easy and economical renovation of the two great vast hotels it plans to demolish, the Hotel Stewart and the Hotel Pennsylvania, one of the largest hotels in the world when it was opened in 1919. Um, in this context, it's interesting to note that the 2021 Pritzker Prize, the highest international architecture award, was just given to two architects who adaptively reuse, not wet waste, vast buildings like this. 
Um, our, our, our friend Brad Vogel often comments that Penn Station was demolished because it was a little dirty and a little grimy. This, th th these, it, these buildings could easily, easily be uh, renovated into a hotel. It's not even adaptive reuse, it's just a uh, renovation. Uh, our community already resembles post-war London. This is the Stewart Hotel uh, in the next block. Our community already resembles post-war London with vast lots left vacant for years where significant buildings that the Landmarks Commission refused to protect and which were leveled for the sake of glassy, glossy development that never got built. In another forum, Simeon, we need to discuss demolition taxes and tax incentives for keeping historic buildings. Um, these are some of, this is some of the historic fabric in the, in the neighborhood. Uh, they're they're uh, buildings as large or seemingly as large as Penn Station. This is the Penn Station service building, which was also designed by McKinney Mead and White as part of the Penn Station terminal city and uh, it's threatened uh, and obviously uh, could be reused for any number of purposes. These are other significant historic buildings which will be demolished. This isn't speculative. They are in the plan to be demolished, the St. John Church. Um, this, these are just examples of, uh, of uh, what I was referring to about, this is the Bancroft building, which was demolished in 2014 and is still a vacant lot. There's, you, you can walk from 28th Street to 30th Street through vast vacant lots where historic buildings once stood. Uh, some of you will be familiar with the Caswell Building on 32nd Street, which we fought hard to save. It has been a vacant lot since 2017, so four years. Currently, this magnificent 1890 Demarest Building by James Renwick is being demolished despite our efforts uh, with uh, HDC and Senator Hoylman and Gal Brewer and a number of other people. It is being demolished as, as we speak for the sake of this uh, glassy, glossy tower, which very likely will not be built. And we will have another vacant lot across from the Empire State Building for years to come. This is our letter and our petition. Um, if you go to, let me see if I could move this. Yes, okay, good. Uh, if you go to humanscale.nyc and see here on take action, click on that and this will send uh, a letter to the Albion, Albany legislators. Uh, I, I personally don't think that the city is completely powerless in this. I'd like to you know, contact Gail Brewer and Corey Johnson, whose district of this is in our senators, uh, as well as our senators to, to fight this. But please, uh, this is our, our, our call to action. And um, Maya, do you want, are you able to update us at all on where this is in, in Albany? I will note that uh, Senator uh, Hoyleman and Liz Kruger did successfully uh, earmark uh, a $1.2 billion to this pro project um, that it could not be spent above ground. It could only be used for underground station uh, uh, improvements. And Maya, I don't know if there's anything else you'd like to add from the senators and your perspective. Sure, thank you, George. Um, so Senator Hoyleman carries a bill S6556, um, um, that is the Empire Station Complex Public Review Act that he introduced with Senator Jackson, Senator Kruger, and Assembly Member Gottfried, um, that would require the state to follow um, New York City's usual land use procedures, ULERP, you're all familiar with it, um, a process that this project is currently exempt from. Um, Senator Hoyleman feels that the ULERT process would ensure that residents and commuters and small businesses and other community stakeholders would have a much more meaningful and formal opportunity to provide input and recommendations. Um, as of now, the legislature is not set um, to reconvene again until January. So we're in a bit of a limbo period with that. Um, and it does seem like ESD may move ahead um, with the approval of the GPP in August. Um, there will be um, a NEPA process um, that will start probably in September or October. Um, and that'll have input, um, that'll have community input um, in a public hearing. Um, those dates have not been announced yet, um, but they will be on the ESD website uh, when they are. Um, generally speaking, Senator Hoyleman is very opposed to this plan in, in its current form. Um, 
He's very appreciative of the involvement of the community boards and other stakeholders who've been meeting weekly um, to try to make the most of a terrible plan. Um, but he sees this as a land grab um, that will line the pockets of developers, um, destroying resident homes, small businesses, um, and historic resources, um, like George, George showed. Uh, um, all for, for building um, eight super tall towers, 10 towers, um, 19.5 million square feet of office space um, at a time when we are at a 19% office vacancy rate, um, something that has increased actually from earlier in the pandemic. Mm -hmm. um, so, and I also, um, it, yeah. Go ahead. And I, I also wanted to note um, that um, Vornado, which owns the Hotel Pennsylvania, um, um, could be demolishing. It's got no protections, despite repeated requests for this and other buildings in the area uh, to the Landmarks Commission. So um, I, I hate to say it, but the Pennsylvania Hotel could be being destroyed as, as, as we speak and, and sending all of that massive uh, material to, uh, to landfill. I'm sure they own other buildings too that could be taken down. They are the largest landholder. So, um, Simeon, are there any questions that um, you'd like to pass on? Um, you're muted. You're muted. <laughs> okay, okay. <laughs> Francoise had, had asked, um, you know, has anyone reached out to our colleagues in the in labor, in organized labor? as they have been very helpful in defeating large scale land plans in the past. Maya, you're nodding your head. So I yeah, don't know. So <laughs> our office has, ESD has not. Um, Hotel Pennsylvania, I'm not remembering the numbers right now, um, but they have a very large um, staff of unionized employees, um, all jobs that will disappear. Um, and so our office has been um, in touch with their organizers um, on this project. Fantastic, they were very, very helpful. Um, the Hotel Workers Union was very helpful back in the day with the plaza. Um, also, uh, are there any more sort of street events or protests now that we are opening up and it is appropriately 90,000 degrees outside? Um, <laughs> Uh, we are planning on events, but the reality is that if the press does not cover these issues, they might be too uh, um, uh, in the weeds for the average um, readers. So if the press isn't going to be there to cover it and we don't have a groundswell of people, um, it's not really a good use of our time. Simeon, you were there, you spoke at the press conference, two press conferences we had? Uh, I uh, yeah. <laughs> two, I kind of wrote two. Okay, yeah, exactly. Um, and it was great and it was a terrific event and it was a lot of effort and Anne McDermott, who's on the call and John Massigale and other people who are from the coalition spoke very eloquently, but we were talking to ourselves. So um, if, unless we can you know, guarantee coverage and and a good turnout, uh, it's not the best um, uh, direction for us at this time. We also were speaking with Dan Biederman, so that counts for something. Oh, yeah, but he, he's on the wrong side of the aisle on, on that. Uh, finally, and then the final question is, uh, no, actually I see Brad Vogel is typing the answer to the question about the Hotel Pennsylvania and the Landmarks Preservation Commission. So, uh, he's got that. Thank you so much, Brad. And uh, thank you. Thank you, Maya. Thank you, George. Thank you. And I'll put the link to the petition in the chat. Yes, yes. Uh, I put the link to the uh, human scale petition also. So that Thank you all. Thank you. Uh, now I'd like to turn this over to Christabel Goff. Christabel is the secretary for the uh, architecture, the Society for the Architecture of the City. And uh, before she begins, uh, I would like to share a little something with you. Great. No sound. I know, I know, we're working on it. Uh. 
The best laid plans. <laughs> I mean, thank you. Thank you. As well. And it's wonderful to have this opportunity to bring up this problem, which is smaller but has a great reach. And I'm, I'm actually going to read a statement because it is in litigation. So the lawyers have seen what I'm going to say. When the landmarks law was enacted, it was the fruit of a long struggle behind the scenes a struggle to produce a draft that could survive the assault of practical politics because it preserved landmarks, but did that without altogether depriving property owners of business opportunities that some of them viewed as a critical need. That was in 1965. The outcome appeared to be a win for preservation at first, but it left the commission exposed, dependent, on the willingness of a mayor to appoint a chair and a majority of commissioners who would be supportive of a system of checks and balances weighted in favor of preservation. This year, we have seen a stunning demonstration of the ways in which the law can also be used not to preserve, but to destroy, to destroy the cultural heritage of New York. Several of these are topics in the seminar today. There are more, notably current litigation contesting LPC decisions affecting the McGraw Hill building and the Williamsburg Savings Bank in Brooklyn. The example I've been asked to discuss is Grand Central Terminal. Its designation in 1967 afforded landmark protection that was promptly challenged in court leading in 1978 to the United States Supreme Court Penn Central decision, which affirmed and upheld the constitutionality of the New York City Landmarks Law. Later in 1980, LPC Chairman Kent Barwick augmented that original Grand Central Terminal designation with designation of the interior. There is a recent court petition identified as Christabel Goff versus the city of New York et al, in which attorney Michael Hiller makes a crucial, if somewhat technical argument that the LPC was wrong to review aspects of the new development known as Project Commodore, using a procedure that led to a non-binding report rather than requiring a certificate of appropriateness analysis and decision which could have meant denial of parts of the plan or mandatory major modifications to the design. The Commodore Hotel site is not a designated landmark, but it directly abuts Grand Central Terminal. And the new project entails alterations, both to the viaduct, which stands on the landmark site and encircles it, and to the terminal interior. The plan also needs a finding concerning a harmonious relationship between the terminal and the new 86 story tower, which is elevated on a curious field of curvilineal supports. While some have commented at length, and we did at the public hearing, John Massengale's later video made the point more succinctly, as you have just seen in just 10 words. Oh no, oh no, oh no, 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 no. Using appropriate procedural forms might not change the ultimate decision since the courage to say no is sorely tested today. A majority of the Landmarks Commissioners now serve at the pleasure of the mayor due to his failure to make timely appointments or reappointments at the end of their terms. So if displeased, the mayor can immediately and quite legally replace commissioners without stating any cause. An example from the past of such pressures was the replacement of Commissioner Anthony Mack's tongue, who in 1987 
initiated a wider public discussion of plans to alter Bryant Park with a new building obscuring the west facade of the New York Public Library. As Sidney Shanberg then commented in New York Newsday, quote, Anthony Tung is not the first ruffler of powerful feathers that City Hall has moved to smother. He spoke out. He was a catalyst. He energized people. So the word was given, get rid of him. Find someone who will get on the team and play ball. However, correct procedure is a critical and indispensable part of landmark regulation. Our lawsuit contends that because Grand Central is controlled by a public authority, the MTA, it is not a city owned property. If it were city owned, it would receive a non-binding report. Properties controlled by public authorities do also receive that treatment, but there is an exception. Public Authorities Law, Section 1266, Subsection 8, contains an exemption, quote, except such facilities that are devoted to purposes other than transportation or transit purposes. Thus, the non-transportation aspects of the application directly involving construction to Grand Central Terminal and the aqueduct, and also involving a major private investment project are not exempt from control by the commission and require a certificate of appropriateness review. If our contention is upheld by the courts in the future, when developers in certain public private partnerships bring forward proposals affecting landmarked properties, they may need to reconsider their designs in the light of historic preservation goals so that their projects could survive a real review, not what we have just seen at the Landmarks Commission, a pro forma love fest celebrating the prowess of the real estate industry in New York and its expertise in circumventing longstanding governmental policies, policies that should protect a major beloved landmark like Grand Central Terminal. That is what I have to say about this at the moment, because we're in litigation. I don't know that I should say anything more. However, if you want to go to uh, villageviews.org, you will find the petition, the full text of the petition. So please do that if you would like to. Thank you so much, Christabel. Um, I've placed the uh, Village Views uh, link in the chat, as well as if you scroll up a little bit, you can also find the New York Post article. Uh, yes, good. <laughs> as well. Um, I don't- Priscilla de Gregory did a beautiful job on that. I don't wish to, uh, well, I won't say anything except that the Post has been actually one of the better outlets for many of these issues of late. It's- um, That is quite true. Unexpected. Uh, <laughs> so thank you. Um, I'm just seeing if there's any new messages related to this, but as you said, um, it, it, this is under litigation, so we shall uh, not do any questions. Finally, um, we I'd like to turn it over to David Sheldon. David is the uh, head of Save Our Seaport, who are uh, a a community group, David, you're still muted. Uh, a community group who is trying to preserve uh, the very beleaguered and uh, quite uh, abused historic character of probably the oldest neighborhood in New York City, I would say. So, David. One of the founders of SOS. Uh, we are a creature of many heads. Uh, we're talking about, uh, let me see if I can share this. Yes. Can you see it? Well, whatever. We're talking about 10 square blocks in lower Manhattan facing the East River. Until larger shipping moved to the Hudson, this was in fact the heart of the Port of New York. South Street was the fabled street of ships. Uh, 
there, the Southgate Seaport Museum was chartered in 1967. The seaport area entered the National Register of Historic Places in 1972, and the Landmarks Preservation Commission itself uh, designated the Historic District in 1977 and expanded it in 1989. This was to be an experiment in urban preservation rather than urban renewal. So what we got, let me see, where are we? Okay. David, if you look on the bottom uh, with the share screen, you should be able to sort of manipulate it eventually. Okay. So what we got were blocks of 19th century buildings and a waterfront for historic vessels with a museum at its heart uh, without much in the way of visible means of support. And I want to point out that one of the interesting things in discussing the Seaport Historic District is that waterfront for us means it is a boundary between two worlds and it is the exchange across that boundary that in fact makes it a seaport. The EDC interestingly enough usually says its boundary ends at the end of the land. Uh, for us, no, it extends into the water because that's where the ships are. Uh, to go on, in 1972, uh, the seaport transfer mechanism was devised. And this was a means to move developmental or air rights out of the district in order to preserve its low scale character. Uh, this mechanism has in fact been used many times. Now that's gonna come up later, but right now I wanna point out, we are still fighting both Save Our Seaport and our partners in the Seaport Coalition, that being Children First, and Southbridge Towers, we are fighting for the long-term viability of the entire district and for its components, including the South Street Seaport Museum. Okay, no problem. The South Street Seaport Museum, uh, an active maritime waterfront, a public market. That area actually featured a public market before the Dutch. Uh, indigenous peoples had a marketplace there. Um, and the integrity of the South Street Seaport District as a whole. And that said, our current crisis is, is a 250 Water Street, which is now a block full of surface parking lot and perhaps a pretty ugly one at that. Uh, but it's a lot that is nonetheless wholly within the Seaport Historic District and included by clear and expressed intention. Uh, originally, it was owned uh, by the Milstein family. Milsteins took several proposals for development to the Landmarks Preservation Commission, where they were shot down. They were shot down, I think four of them were, because they were too tall, too massive, too overwhelming. Uh, they would uh, basically diminish the impact of the district as a whole. There were several more proposals that Milstein decided not to even bother going to LBC because he knew he wasn't going to get anywhere. Then, of course, came Howard Hughes Corporation about 10 years ago. Uh, and they bought the lot, they would have us believe only a few years ago. I think they had their eyes on it well before that, but that's my opinion. But they have been on the march ever since. Uh, and what they want to build there is a much taller structure than the zoning allows. Zoning, not something that normally comes into the consideration of landmarks preservation. However, in this case, in 2003, all of the parties involved, including the Milsteins, Community Board One, several elected officials, uh, I believe the Downtown Alliance, and the South Street Seaport Museum agreed, let's not fight this out at Landmarks every time. Let's get together and establish a height limit, which they did at 120 feet. And this was incorporated into the zoning. So all parties involved at that time reached a decision on what their definition of too tall would be. So this year, what does the Landmarks Preservation Commission do? Well, after two huge public hearings, and I mean, they were massive, they went on for hours, decided that a 324 foot high slab of a building proposed by the Use Corporation would be appropriate on this site. I think you see a picture of it actually in the announcement for this this webinar, um, it's that big. 
Uh, now, this is only my opinion, but it certainly looked to me that Chair Sarah Carroll was grinning and practically winking as she told commissioners that appropriateness was a notion that could change over time and that precedent would be no constraint. Yeah, I have it on tape. Now, zoning is not something the commission considers, and yet here the parties agreed in 2003 on a standard of restraint. So what does the commission do? Eh, we're suing. We have a suit, an Article 78 suit launched against the Landmarks Preservation Commission. Now, there's another player we, we are, and perhaps a key player, right? That's the New York City Economic Development Corporation, which seems determined to hand the seaport and its future and its purpose over to the Howard Hughes Corporation. Uh, I don't think we share this problem with the, other, with the other proponents here. This particular historic district is completely within the jurisdiction of EDC. They're the landlord. Ouch. And what they're trying to do, basically, is privatize it, as I see it. Uh, just uh, put this in your hats. The largest single stockholder in the Howard Hughes Corporation is hedge fund billionaire Bill Ackman. That's the guy with the billion dollar apartment on the west side. So we are asking ourselves, why is the EDC determined to make Ackman richer? Now, just a brief aside on the EDC role in this, the EDC responded uh, to controller Scott Stringer in January 2020 uh, regarding the question of seaport air rights, their disposal, ownership, and transfer. EDC outlined a very, 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 a series of very specific steps that would be needed to move air rights uh, from other use holdings to 250 Water Street. EDC has been backpedaling ever since, especially since that memo was brought up in a recent land use committee meeting at, at Community Board One. Now, we actually found, Seaport Coalition actually found a buyer for seaport development rights outside of the seaport historic district went to the city and said, look, this will solve your problems, right? Interest from the city? Nothing. By the way, it is now proposed to extend the Howard Hughes Corporation lease in the seaport to 99 years. Yeah. So, and then here is where I really wish I did have a picture, but I don't have one. Uh, before Community Board one now, there is a piece of gender, gerrymandering uh, to facilitate this same transfer of air rights from uh, Pier 17 and the Tin Building to 250 Water Street. Basically, they have taken the demapped streets and tried to turn it into a zoning lot uh, that would extend the uh, large-scale development area. And this would make, in theory, the two areas, the granting sites at 250 Water Street, contiguous. Uh, this is, I think, I, I wish I had the picture because it really does look like a gerrymandered district. It's insane. I couldn't, I couldn't download it. It was in a video. Uh, this is being opposed by the board and I hope by the city, except for the EDC. Uh, political cover here has been very carefully orchestrated. Uh, Howard Hughes, its architects, and the museum itself have harped on a $50 million windfall that will be the museum's once the proposal is approved. Uh, when you see this stuff in text, read it very carefully because your impression is going to be, at least the impression of a great many people has been, oh, Hughes is going to write a check to the museum. No, nah, it's not what it says, not when you read it closely. I'll give you a quote from a recent dispatch from... Uh, one of the principals at Howard Hughes, Saul Searle, quote, importantly, the project will generate substantial funding to stabilize and reopen the South Street Seaport Museum. So where's the money come from? Where's the binding commitment? What's the guarantee? There is no commitment. Frankly, the museum has been boasting it's going to get a lockbox agreement for over a year. It doesn't have any such agreement yet. The money, if it comes, will be coming from the EDC out of the sale of development rights, not from Howard Hughes. Howard Hughes is paying the money for the development rights. So 
So this is not exactly the generous deal maker it's presented as. And I would point out that since the size of the proposed building has been reduced, so has the promoted large S. As a further distraction, you threw in a design, uh, and only a design for a shiny new building for the museum on a lot the museum does not own. To be built with money the museum does not have, it is to be sheathed in copper, literally a glittering distraction. In the meantime, the museum space in Scrubberhorn Row is to be reduced in favor of guess who? Howard Hughes. March 2013, Susan Henshaw Jones, then the leader of the Museum of the City of New York, and at the time also leading the South Street Seaport Museum at the behest of Mayor Bloomberg, pointed out in a memorandum that the museum was essentially strangled, being strangled between the developer Howard Hughes Corporation and the EDC, neither of which would allow the museum any prerogative, frankly, to make money. Affordable housing, I'm not even going to talk about it. We've been facing that dodge. Everybody faces that dodge. I just want to point out, I have here a copy of the Robert Moses proposal for the Lower Manhattan Expressway from 1968. Uh, one of the benefits would be, yeah, housing. They've been promising housing forever. And we know where that is at. Uh, I want to point out the site was a location of a major thermometer factory. So it is polluted with mercury. Uh, it is now in the state's brownfield cleanup program. And it has garnered the greatest community input, I think, from any such project in the state. It has been phenomenal. So I want to come now briefly, things you can do. Uh, Howard Hughes Corporation is running a very good media game. We're starting to catch up, but they still have the means and <laughs> major PR firms to push it. So when you hear it, please debunk it as you can. I urge everyone here, uh, keep fighting your fights. I think we're all greater than the sum of our parts. We have launched a lawsuit. Uh, yeah, send money. If you... <laughs> If you go to the Seaport Coalition website, there are several options for how to send money that will go exclusively to that lawsuit. Uh, there will be a community board meeting, community board one. Uh, tomorrow, there will be an hour of public comment. We know use has been mobilizing, uh, I'll be frank, a bunch of its tenants, a bunch of its clients. Uh, to go in support of its proposal. That's not to say there aren't people that don't honestly agree with it. Uh, the museum, for its part, will probably be sending a number of its board members to tout the plan, and we're going to be there too. Although we've been to so many hearings at this point, we, we prefer to say, here's a petition that we had a couple days to put together with you know, about 900 signatures. Save the board some time. Uh, the City Planning Commission will be hearing this issue in September, so we're going to urge people to go there. Please do stay in touch. Get on our mailing list, either at Save Our Seaport or Seaport Coalition. Uh, we will be active. We hope, uh, well, let's see, if the ver latest variant passes us by, we will be going public. And I want to make a proposal. I I've noticed everyone, well, not everybody here, but a number of our organizations have really stand up support from their community boards. And I'm wondering if we put our heads to it, if we couldn't find at least a section of common language that we could ask all of these boards to pass together with follow up language that would you know, dovetail their own particular issues. The community board is supposedly the vehicle for public input into all of these processes, even though it only has the power to opine. But perhaps if we got them all to raise their voices in common, uh, it might raise an eyebrow, might draw some attention, and might gain us more support citywide because they will certainly hang us all separately unless we stand together. And that's my. That's my story and I'm sticking to it. Thank you.
Thank you so much, David. Um, I think that you you covered, you seem to cover the ground. Uh, the next stop, uh, your, just to recap, the uh, your group is an Article 78 against the Landmarks Commission, and also you are fighting the... Um, Zoning variation. The, the, yeah, so that's still working through the, through the yes. process. Okay. So that... Um, People should look at the webs uh, the Sabre Seaport website. We have, uh, I've been posting it uh, to keep up on that. Um, so thank you all. Thank you all to all of our uh, presenters. Um, and we've got a lot of work ahead of us. Um, we will be, HCC will be uh, recording this. People that have has recorded this. We will be posting it. Um, we will also be following up with ways that you can get involved and learn more to all of the uh, app, all the whatchamacallitis, all the attendees. And um, thank you all very, very much. Um, have a good evening. Thank you, Simeon. Thank you, HTC.